Hello everyone and welcome. This is the CyberSec Study CISSP video bootcamp series. You are watching the free version of this domain. For access to the full version, go to the website at www.cybersecstudy.com. So hello everyone again, my name is Donald Parker. The reason you're watching this video is because you're interested in obtaining the CISSP certification, and in some cases you need it, right, uh, for your job. The reason I'm here is because I developed a training program that can help you get past this doggone exam. So the program consists of a book of the course material, audio recordings of all of that content in the book. We have uh, the video recordings now of all of the content of all eight domains. Uh, I developed a Jeopardy style game that has questions that are based from the course material and then a Kahoot competition style game where folks can compete and test their knowledge of, uh, of the, the information in the, uh, in the course material. So this is a copy of the book. It's a little thicker than I really wanted it to be. Uh, but this is a hard copy version of the course material. Uh, if you purchase the audio or the video, then I'll also give you a soft copy uh, of this course material. So for the book, you know, it took me several years to write this book. I had, uh, I used several sources. Uh, the, the, the common body of knowledge, of course, the CBK is the most authoritative source. Uh, I also used the, the late, great Sean Harris's all-in-one study guide. It's a phenomenal uh, book. I used uh, several practice question uh, uh, exam books that had explanations, very good explanations of, uh, of key terms and concepts. And then the internet, of course. So I went through all these sources. I tried to group together the smallest grouping of terms that I thought would help you pass the exam. So. I tried to, uh, I, I categorized all these terms into either just terms, informational notes, concepts, and something I call muscle memory, um, which is all those algorithms and the OSI model and the ports and protocols and all that stuff that's just muscle memory that we have to memorize. I broke that out separately so that you could print out those muscle memory charts and focus on the muscle memory separate from understanding the terms and the concepts that I want you to know. So the focus of, of my book, of, of this course material, is ident to identify key terms and to expose you to those key terms in many different ways. Uh, I went through a couple of boot camps myself. Um, I've taught boot camps with other people's uh, course material. And, and what I felt from those classes is that they were just throwing a bunch of information at you, just a ton of information. There's no way any of that stuff was sticking. So the intent of my program is to identify key terms so that when you're taking that exam and you're reading a test question, you, you see three or four key words and, that, and those will point you to the, the, uh, the correct answer. So we go through, as you go through this video series, you'll see these and hear these key terms. Um, when we play rounds of Jeopardy, they're focused on these key terms. And when you test your knowledge with Kahoot, uh, you're gonna see these key terms again. So multiple times you're seeing these key terms and they're just embedded in your brain. Um, folks. So you could purchase the book, read the book. Uh, you could listen to the audio, which is just a verbatim word for word. Um, illustration of the book. You can read or listen to the audio and follow along in the book at the same time. You could purchase the video series that you're looking at now, the full version of the video series for all eight domains, which is just the video recordings are um, a recording of a boot camp we just finished a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it turned out a lot better than I expected and I, I think it can be really helpful. You could also watch or compete in rounds of Jeopardy, which, uh, you know, after you've gone through all the material and you're ready to see where you're at and test your knowledge, uh, there are 15 rounds of Jeopardy to get through all eight domains. But then Kahoot, 
Um, I, uh, Kahoot is something that we do on a, uh, a weekly basis uh, in the evenings. You could, uh, if you go to the website and, and purchase the ability to compete in one of these competitions, there's one for each domain. Uh, the number of questions varies, but after you compete in this competition against other people who are preparing for the exam, it gives me a spreadsheet of every question and every answer whether you answered wrong or right, so that I can sit down with you and know where you're weak and where you're strong. The people who compete well at Kahoot pass the exam the first time, every time. So, so the question that I, I often get, I think I get more often than any other question is, you know, what's my success rate? Uh, how many of my students actually pass the exam? So I've been teaching CISSP boot camps for uh, with my own material for about five or six years. I've been teaching the boot camp for over 10 years, but um, all of my students pass the exam. If you go through my entire boot camp, I can tell you with the Kahoot rounds and the printout, the, the spreadsheet that comes out of that, I can tell you whether I think you're ready or not. If you're ready, you take the exam, those people pass every time. If you're not ready, I'll tell you, and I'll tell you what I think you need to work on. Now, I've had some folks who took the exam anyway, even after I told them that I think we need more time. Um, they didn't pass the first time. I worked with them some more afterwards, and they passed the second time. So um, really, it's, it's up to you. If you can get through all of this content, it's a marathon of material to get through. If you really want it, uh, if you really need it, then if you can get through all of this content, I am very confident that you can get through the first time, but I would need to see you compete on Kahoot rounds in order to know for sure whether I think you're ready. All right, guys, that's it. Uh, welcome to the program. Welcome to this journey uh, uh, to cybersecurity. It is the fastest growing um, industry in the world. It's the most exciting, in my opinion. I love what I do. I love working with this stuff. I love talking about it. I love sharing information. Um, so again, uh, if you're interested in the full version, go to uh, www.cybersexstudy.com and uh, take care. guys this is domain two of the cybersex study CISSP program domain two is entitled asset security uh, it's a really short domain so we'll uh, we'll go ahead and knock it out as quickly as possible and tackle as much of domain three as we can tonight all right so term number 90 an asset, Wikipedia defines an asset as an economic resource or anything tangible or intangible that's capable of being owned or controlled to produce value and is held to have a positive economic value. Uh, assets, people are assets as well. Anything you own in that organization. When I step into an organization as a risk manager, the first thing I want to do is identify all our assets assign a monetary value to them, even the people. I want to know what their salaries are, um, all that stuff. And then I identify any vulnerabilities to those assets, any threats to those vulnerabilities, if they exist. If I have both a threat and a vulnerability, then I know I have a risk. Then I'm going to look at the likelihood of that threat overcoming the vulnerability. I'm going to look at the impact of that threat overcoming that vulnerability, give an overall risk rating, and that's my risk register. And I just maintain that. Um, over the over the over the years. All right, uh, some more key terms. We've got data management. We see that word management. Data management is a process involving a broad range of activities, from administrative to technical aspects of handling data. So, data policy defines strategic, long-term goals. Remember that uh, planning horizon, OTS, operational, tactical, and strategic. 
Um, data policy defines strategic long-term goals, clearly define roles and responsibilities, data quality. Um, again, we're just managing data. A data policy is a set of high-level principles. You see that word policy, think high-level. High-level principles that establish a guiding framework. Framework is another word that tells us the, the framework of a house, what to do, but not necessarily how to do it. Uh, so high-level principles that establish a guiding framework for data management that can be used to address strategic issues such as data access, relevant legal matters, data stewardship, and custodial duties, and uh, data acquisition. So I'm reading through these sentences, and I'm looking for those key words. And this is exactly what we're going to do when we, see, when we start going through practice questions. We're looking for all those key words, high level, uh, framework, management, strategic. Uh, data life cycle, information has a life that consists of creation, use, and then finally destruction. The information must be protected, available to only those who require access to it, and destroyed when it's no longer needed. And then data ownership. Um, generally, uh, data owners generally have legal rights over the data, along with uh, copyright and intellectual property rights. Data ownership implies the right to exploit the data, as well as the right to destroy it, uh, when maintenance becomes unnecessary or uneconomical. A data custodian, so another thing, the data owner is responsible for categorizing the information, determining how sensitive it is. The data custodian is, I, I see that word custodian, I think of a janitor with a set of keys whose, um, you know, his job is to protect the data in accordance with the level that the data owner categorized it at. So data custodians are established to ensure that important data sets are developed, maintained, and are accessible within their defined specifications. And the, again, the data owner defines those specifications. A data set is a collection of data. It can be the contents of a single database table, or a single statistical data matrix where every column of the table represents a particular value, a variable, and each row corresponds to a given uh, member of the data uh, in question. But you see that word data set, it's just a collection of data. Data quality, quality is applied to data has been defined as fitness for use or potential use. So a loss of data quality at any point in the life cycle reduces the applicability and uses to which the data can be adequately, adequately put. Metadata is data about data. Um, it's uh, you create a file, the date that you created it was, is metadata, the size of the file is metadata. Uh, Wikipedia defines metadata as information about how long a document is, who the author is, when the document was created, and a short summary of the document. And just to give you a, a quick example, I think I mentioned this um, in, in most of my classes, but I've, I uh, accidentally formatted an external hard drive with all my kids' pictures on it and um, downloaded one of these tools to help me restore that information just because you delete or format a drive does not mean the information is gone. It's just the pointers to the information is gone. So this tool was able to bring all that information, all the pictures back, but all the metadata was gone. So I couldn't see the date that the pictures were taken. So I couldn't remember, you know, I didn't have the date, the age of, of my kids. <laughs> you had to kind of look at their pictures and guess how old they were, uh, but at least I still had the file. But data about data, the of course, the, the, our government is, is saying that uh, they're collecting metadata on us, and that's not important. But metadata, man, uh, I could probably tell you more with metadata than I can the actual data. Data, you know, they're 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 not they're not, or they say they're not recording our actual conversations. They're just collecting the metadata about who we talk to, how often we talk to them, 
how long we talk to them when we do talk to them. I mean, that's all really, really important information that can tell you a lot about the relationship between two people. All right, so we jump from that into hardware technology, and I've got a nice video that we're going to watch uh, over the weekend about this. Um, a hard disk drive versus a solid state drive. A hard disk drive has a spinning component. That disk spins, and this little head here reads the information. SDD, solid state, no moving parts. Any uh, mechanical device that, that has moving parts is eventually going to break over time. Those moving parts, the more moving parts, the, the worse. Uh, if you don't have any moving parts, then it's going to be more durable. On a hard disk drive, the data is magnetically written onto the drive by altering the magnetic field on the hard drive platter. HDDs are mechanical, so the read-write head must physically move and the platter must rotate to access the location of the write data. Solid state drives use flash memory to store data, and flash memory electronically stores bits of data in many arrays of memory cells. Unlike hard disk drives, uh, mechanically moving pieces are not required. Data remnants, I just talked about this. Uh, if, even though you delete or purge uh, a, the information off of a system, it's just like when you write something in pencil and erase it. The, um, you can't see it visually, but that indentation is still there um, so that it's still possible to recover. Uh, and again, but words like remnants, uh, the, these are folks that have a big vocabulary, have a greater chance of passing this exam just because they can recognize the meaning of these words. Data remnants is the residual physical representation of data that's been in some way erased. After storage media is erased, there may be, may be some physical characteristics that allow the data to be reconstructed. So some of the countermeasures to uh, data remnants. Uh, these are, uh, I, most people <laughs> seem to struggle with these a little bit, uh, but let's walk through them one by one. So with clearing, clearing is the removal of sensitive data from storage devices in such a way that there's assurance that the data may not be recovered using normal uh, methods. It, it can be recovered, but it's just not, uh, you know, you'll have to use some kind of special utility or something. The data may still be recoverable, but not, with, not without special laboratory techniques. Um, the key with all of these is once the, 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 the act is performed to remove the information, is the information recoverable? And then is the media that that information was stored on, is it still reusable? So with clearing, if you clear, clearing is uh, deleting is an example of clearing information. Uh, when you do that, yes, the information is recoverable. You have to use some special utility or application to do it, but it is recoverable. And then the media is still reusable. With purging or sanitizing, first of all, we need to recognize that purging and sanitizing are the same thing. Digital media involves uh, removing data in such a way that the data can't be recovered. So when you purge or sanitize, the information on the media can't be recovered, yet the media can, can be reused. So the first one was media still recoverable. Uh, I mean, information still recoverable, media still reusable. The second one, information is not recoverable, but the media is uh, reusable. And if we follow that logical progression, data destruction, information is permanently gone, can't be recovered, and the media is destroyed, can't be reused. The best way to destroy electronic media is to physically destroy it. We do have these programs that are right zeros and ones all over the data, but you've got to do it like 15, 20 times in order for it to really have an impact. And just to, just to be safe, go ahead and physically destroy that thing. So if you've got any, you know, I, I want to give a, <laughs> uh, uh, some training to, to anybody who's a, who considers themselves to be a player out there. Um, you, you, you're, there's no way you can, you can do what you're doing and not leave a digital footprint. 
Um, and in today's day and age, it's just a matter of time with technology that's going to eliminate cheating. Cheating, you won't be able to cheat, and you got to get it out of your system. Either that, or it's going to identify those folks who just aren't monogamous and allow them to just be who they are, and then allow the monogamous people to uh, to be who they are. <laughs> but it's coming. Uh, so some methods used with data remnants. We've got um, overriding is an example of clearing. Um, degaussing is an example of data destruction. Uh, and then crypto erase, uh, I wouldn't say that that's, uh, uh, that, that could possibly be an example of purging or sanitizing, but really uh, overriding and degaussing are examples of these first two, clearing or the, uh, the first and the last one, clearing and data destruction. So overriding information stored in physical media is stored in ones as ones and zeros, binary format. Uh, for example, the sequence of zeros and ones could represent the letter of F. Uh, this, the, and we may watch a video this weekend that shows how that really, and I think it's important to understand at that level that um, depending on the number of bits of your system will determine <clears throat> the sequence of zeros and ones that make up every letter and symbol. So to erase the letter F, if the sequence 0, 1, 0 represents the letter F, to erase the letter F from storage, you would overwrite it with a sequence of all zeros or all ones. A letter or word written in pencil on a piece of paper, we just saw that picture, uh, could be recovered after you use an eraser to remove it. Electronic media operates the same way. When information is erased or overwritten, the electronic media, uh, or from the electronic media, the information can still be recovered. So if you've got some old uh, uh, smartphones laying around the house, some old hard drives with some, some pictures that you probably shouldn't have, you need to destroy those suckers completely. A guy named Carl Friedrich Gauss, Dr. Carl Friedrich Carl Friedrich Gauss was a researcher in the field of magnetism who created a method of decreasing or eliminating a magnetic field called degaussing. Um, degaussing damages the magnetic media in such a way that the information is permanently removed and the media can no longer be uh, reused. And the crypto erase involves encrypting data before it's stored on the media. Um, the encryption key can then be overwritten. So you, you encrypt all the data on the media and the key that you use to encrypt it, uh, that you would need to decrypt it, you would just destroy that key and the information could not be recovered. All right, uh, information classifications. Let's do a time check. It's 6.44. Okay, we're... we're uh, we're making really good time. Anybody have any questions or comments so far? How are we doing? Quick question for you, boss. What do you got? Um, can you use the can you use the Gaussian on uh, SDD? On say again. On a S on a uh, solid state drive. Uh, it's my understanding you can. This is actually a picture of a, it, it's really a large magnetic or, or magnet. Um, and it's my understanding those SDDs, you know, they're, they're um, electromagnetic information or uh, using electromagnetism. So if you put that large magnet next to it and it'll destroy it. That's my understanding. All right, let's talk about uh, information classification. Those of us who are information system security officers, we're used to categorizing information. Um, and that involves uh, looking at the impact to an organization if information is compromised. But here we are classifying, we're putting information into different classes. The data owner has the authority to classify information um, and we're really just putting it in, into containers identifying containers of sensitivity and then putting information in the correct container 
excuse me. So the thing we need to know for the exam, FT quote, we need to we need to know that the private sector has different classification levels than the public sector in most cases. Um, so when you see these terms, confidential, uh, private, sensitive, you need to recognize that these are classification levels for the private sector. But you also need to recognize that confidential is more sensitive than private, which is more sensitive than sensitive, which is more sensitive than public. When you see top secret secret, which, which makes it easy, we know that, that that's a uh, data classification for the public sector, federal, federal agencies. We need to know that top secret is more sensitive than secret, more sensitive than confidential, sensitive but unclassified, and then unclassified. So we have some rules for how to classify information. Uh, classification rule number one, too many classification levels will be impractical and add confusion. So we look at these classification levels here for the private sector, we've got one, two, three, four. That's, that's uh, a pretty decent number. Three or four, I think is the best. But if you had seven, eight, nine different levels, it's going to be hard to know which level, which classification uh, to put information into. So that classification rule number one, too many classification levels will be impractical, impractical and add confusion. Uh, we have different levels when we do risk assessments. We, we talked about having just three categories, high, medium, or low. Um, I don't like having very high, high, medium, low, and very low. I think that that's too many um, levels and adds confusion. Classification rule number two, too few classification levels will give the perception of how little value is placed on the process and how little it'll be used. So if you've just got two classification levels, it may not, uh, uh, well, maybe that, uh, there may be a reason why you would do that, but uh, too few will make it seem as though it's not even necessary. Classification rule three, there should be no overlap in the criteria definitions between classification levels. Uh, there should be no ambiguity or confusion about which category information should be placed. And then classification rule number four, uh, classification levels should be developed for both the data and for software. So your applications, you want to uh, classify those as well. Uh, and this is all information that could be used in our BIA to help us identify if there's a business process that uses critical information or applications that are involved in, in using that critical information, then we might, um, you know, our recovery time objectives and all that stuff may, may be impacted by that. So here's our second muscle memory chart for our classification rules. Uh, Examples of information types include medical information, PII, payment card information. These types of information can be grouped into information classification categories, depending on how sensitive and critical they are to an organization or a federal agency. <clears throat> and I mentioned categorization a minute ago. It's the process of determining the impact to an organization if the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of the information is compromised. So don't mix up categorization with classification. Classification, you're organizing data. I think of containers, container for the really sensitive information, container for the not so sensitive, and a container for the not sensitive at all. With categorization, we're looking at what would be the impact to the organization if the C, I, or A were compromised. Asset management, that word management again, we're managing assets. Inventory management is about capturing the basics of what assets are, uh, what assets are on hand, where they reside, and who owns them. It's about maintaining an accurate, up to date view of owned hardware and software assets so that at any time you can see an actual state of the components that comprise your infrastructure. Next week.
All right, so thanks guys. Have a great night. Thank <laughs> you.